Well, welcome everyone to our fourth episode of Ideas and Lives. And we're pleased that we have today a top flight financial economist who's uh, also a friend and uh, very interested in public policy, a whole range of issues. And uh, I'm Bob Lerman, co-host of Ideas and Lives. And we have Zvi, Zvi Bodhi. Hey there. And um, we sometimes call it the Bob and Zvi show, but uh, we're also calling it Ideas and Lives. Right. That's how to get access to it on Spotify as a podcast. And also um, there's a YouTube version so you can actually see us talking as well as hear us. Um, I'm gonna let Svi introduce our guest today and uh, get us started. Okay, thanks, Bob. Well, with, with Debbie Lucas, we have an interesting, well, interesting ideas and an interesting life. So why don't we start with the life, okay? Tell us what your early life was like and how it shaped you. Okay, well, first, thank you for including me in this interesting series. Um, my early life, um, so I was born in Seattle, but I grew up in Santa Monica, California by the beach. Um, my parents um, were Anne Lucas and Al Lucas. Um, my mother was a refugee from Hitler. She grew up in Austria and came over when in her late teens. Um, and my father was the son of um, people who had fled the pogroms of Eastern Europe. So I guess that qualifies me as having a pretty typical Jewish American heritage. Um, so um, one of the nice things about growing up in Santa Monica was um, that it happened to be in the shadow of the Rand Corporation. And uh, my best friends happened to be the kids of, you know, the people who were um, associated with the defense think tank industry. So I wound up um, actually becoming essentially part of the family of Alan Entoven, who you might know as a famous um, economist who started out um, as actually a student and then colleague of Ken Arrow and um, went yeah. on to solve the arrow Entoven theorem with him. He went on to work a lot on um, national defense policy. He wrote a book on how much is enough and uh, that was quite famous for questioning um, excessive defense spending. He switched gears entirely and went into healthcare where he was really the father of managed competition. I'm going into detail on that because um, he was probably the greatest influence on my life, at least as an economist, um, because what I saw pretty much at his dinner table in his backyard in Santa Monica was just a discussion between him and his friends of, you know, what's going on in the world, um, what we, we as economists, as individuals can kind of actively do um, to try to make things better. So there was kind of an unabashed um, optimism about the possibility of being part of change. And I found that very enthralling. And I guess I um, carried that with me. So later on, I um, wound up um, actually living with his family for the last few years of high school. Um, after that, I went straight to the University of Chicago that was kind enough to um, give me a full scholarship and I stayed there for, as both an undergraduate and a PhD student. Um, the University of Chicago wow. was a great dream for me, but I'll, I'll pause and let you um, intercede with other, other questions. But I was gonna say that that, you know, I always was kind of a nerd as a child and uh, there's no place like the University of Chicago for a nerd to go and pursue intellectual. Yeah, things. Bob, Bob uh, knows that because his older daughter went to the University of Chicago. And my a brother, one of my brothers just older than me, went and uh, when he would come home to South Bend, it was very inspiring with uh, the general education and all of the things that uh, were interesting at the University of Chicago. Uh, I 
certainly recall Antoven's book, How Much is Enough, and his contributions in health economics. So is those he, are great examples. Has, has he passed away? No, he's um, living in Atherton, California. He's in his late 80s. Um, he's still writing about healthcare. We were corresponding about a piece he had written just a few weeks ago. So wow. he's still devote. I mean, he 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 has um, incredible devotion to um, the work that he does, and to his family, by the way. So the, you know, it's kind of a remarkable family. Six kids. Um, very, very solid, great model for how to be in life, really. Yeah, he, he's religious. The family is religious, right? The family is is um, quite Catholic, and um, but Catholic means a lot of things. <laughs> so I think they have a deep faith, um, but are you know devoted to goodness, being good, being good to people, being good to each other. So it's kind of a a nice um, mix of a religion and fundamentally good nature. I think he's when not you, teaching anymore, you, though, is he? No, he's not teaching. Right. When, you, when you started at Chicago, did you know you would go into economics with all those inspiring figures out West? Um, I, I thought I would. I wound up concentrating on economics and applied math. Um, I was really fascinated though by philosophy. And I was, you know, I was thinking about, well, what really made a deep impression on me so um, I, I, you know, my most memorable courses were about Wittgenstein and politics. And um, I did find economics fascinating, but less at an undergraduate level. So I put more effort into trying to become a halfway decent mathematician. And when you decided to go to grad school, was there any thought of other schools or? <laughs> well, I did think about um, my current um, school, MIT, MIT um, but they solidly rejected me, which um, was probably the right thing to do at the time. I probably had too much fun as an undergraduate and wasn't that diligent <laughs> about <laughs> grades. And it actually came as a, as a kind of an awakening shock, and I thought, well, I, that really can't happen again. So. Better, better be a little bit more serious about school and grades and things. Well, and you, at, you, you got your vengeance. You came back to teach him. <laughs> yeah, now you can reject others. But That's right. Um, so uh, what did you concentrate on in grad school? Um, so I was pretty eclectic in graduate school. I actually took prelims in industrial organization and mathematical economics. And then I wrote a thesis on the monetary transmission mechanism of monetary policy. Um, so you might ask, well, what does any of that have to do with finance? Actually, my only contact with finance in graduate school was an excellent class by John Ingersoll, which was theoretical. I remember a 24-hour exam um, where I had a migraine headache the whole time I was taking it. I turned out to do okay on it, but I don't think I, um, <laughs> I didn't really learn that much finance until I went to teach finance. Um, in, in any case, um, if I switched to kind of graduate life, it I would be remiss not to really emphasize how much Sandy Grossman, who was my thesis advisor, um, shaped my understanding of how to do economics, how to ask questions, um, how to really think about things carefully and deeply, how to not be wrong a lot or to try <laughs> to avoid it. Um, so he was amazingly influential. I always describe myself as having been his indentured servant. I made the mistake of at least for when he first hired me, he would say, oh, well, if you can prove this, I'll pay you. And of course, you should never accept a contract <laughs> from someone who could very well prove something themselves if it were easy, saying, if you can prove this, then you'll get paid. So we, we switched to a more of an hour. Well, day. was he at, he was at Chicago? He was at Chicago. You know, he's also a Chicago through and through product. He was there as an undergraduate and then as a graduate student. He left a short while, I guess, after I graduated. Um, and John Ingersoll was at Yale, wasn't he? 
He was eventually, but he also passed through Chicago. Oh, that's interesting. And how did you uh, then, you said you uh, became a financial economist, you began to, when you said you taught finance, how did that transformation take place? So when I was on the job market, I um, was fortunate to be able to go to a lot of schools and had a few offers, but it came down to trying to decide between going to the macroeconomics group at Yale or um, going to Kellogg in the finance group. So really the finance department at Kellogg was the only finance group I spoke to. Um, it was a really vibrant group of individuals. I was drawn to people like Milt Harris, um, who was there at the time. He left shortly after I arrived, so it didn't, that didn't pan out too well. Um, but it just seemed like a place where people were very thoughtful, very serious. Um, Yale was a little more stodgy. Um, it wasn't clear to me. I should say that my dissertation um, was a bit controversial um, because I was interested in putting sticky prices as a transmission mechanism into a general equilibrium model and seeing how that all played out. Um, but as it turned out, um, the, those who were um, Keynesians, hardcore Keynesians, I think really didn't see the use of all that general equilibrium nonsense. And then those who were more freshwater stalwarts thought, well, how can you just assume sticky prices because you haven't derived them from first principles? So, you know, my dissertation was kind of in this weird netherland. But anyway, I felt like Yale just didn't feel like it was going to be home to me. It was probably too Keynesian coming. What, from what year was that? that? What year was that when you uh, came on the market? 86. 86. Yeah. So Tobin was still active? Yes, I probably shouldn't say it, but Tobin is why I didn't go to Yale. Because the questions he asked me during my seminar suggested that I might, um, work might not be held in the regard that I would be comfortable with. I, I'm sure it wasn't true. I mean, you know, you never know. But the job market, I've, my own experiences on the job market have made me always very conscious about not being too cruel to people who are passing through because they might remember it for the rest of their lives. But I'm, I'm still intrigued by the fact that um, your, uh, un, your graduate training, you know, had what one course in finance um, and you became part of this finance group. Uh, did you learn by doing or <laughs> did you, how did you, uh, I mean, I know that if I only took one finance course, uh, I wouldn't have been able to, uh, to handle the stuff. Um, how did that, how did that work? Well, you have to pity my first few generations of <laughs> students Students, because there was a right. lot of <laughs> learning by doing. I wound up teaching money markets, which was more related to macro than yeah. some aspects of finance. And I would say it wasn't really until I finally, many years later, taught the basic corporate finance class that I said, oh, <laughs> that's what <laughs> finance is. So it, it, you know, it took actually quite a large number of years to make that transition and um, between, because I really was a you know, you could say I was a macroeconomist, but I was really an economic theorist. And, and, and from that background, from the math econ, from just being interested in exploring ideas with theory. So I'd say, you know, I, I took two years of graduate school just because I was determined to try to put the effects of fixed costs into general equilibrium, which turned out to be a total failure. But you know, I just kind of was like a dog with a bone because I had this intuition, which I probably still have, that economists underestimate the importance of fixed costs and that they so limit this number of things any individual can do. And that should have a kind of a first order effect. Um, but actually making that work mathematically is complicated because there's all kinds of non-convexities and things. So. I think anyway, but, but the point was that I was kind of ready to consider any economic idea. And I think this like the strict 
we've we've come so much to specialize in subfields, but I've never thought that was very constructive in economics or finance. But, but let, it should be said that her that Debbie's path from an economics <clears throat> department PhD into a uh, finance department at a first rate school was not that unusual. There were a lot of people who were attracted to finance at that time because, I mean, it was the middle of the financial revolution. There were yeah. all these great ideas coming out. Uh, I think it's still the case that there are all these great <laughs> ideas coming out. And uh, so I was one of those people. Uh, Bob McDonald, who was your colleague, I don't know if he, did he arrive before you at Northwestern? He did. He arrived maybe two years before I did. As you probably know, he's, he was and still is one of my best friends. Uh, just talked to him yesterday, in fact. Um, and he, you know, you were asking, how did I learn finance on the job? Bob McDonald was a very big part of that. So I worked closely with him from the beginning. And he's a very good economist, a very good financial economist. And as you said, Zvi, um, if you look at the top finance departments, many, many people have PhDs from in economics. So there's, oh, yeah. you know, it's, and Bob it's kind of dominant. Yeah, Bob's one Zvi of Bodhi them. being another. another Zvi Bodhi being another. <laughs> so, no, there was nothing but, too unusual about that. And, and, but, and also Northwestern, their finance group has always had an economics flavor to it. I, I, I think it's, uh, to me, as a non-financial economist, um, you know, I see the macro route, but I also see the route of uh, people interested in uncertainty and risk um, coming into play. Uh, you, you seem to have come into it from the first, uh, the macro side, uh, but then I assume you were taken in on the uh, uncertainty and risk component. You know, it's interesting, both, both uh, Franco Modigliani and Mert Miller <clears throat> had a very strong interest in macro as well. And they are, you know, the two of the founding fathers of modern finance. Right. So I guess I would say that I came into economics with a passion for public policy and I realized eventually, <laughs> but I think already understood a bit along the way that um, where, where finance and public policy intersect is in valuation. And so my interest in risk is less actually in risk management than in its effect on value. I mean, they're both very important, um, but personally, I've been much more interested, in, you know, people say finance is the study of time and uncertainty on value, um, but my focus is very, has very much been on value, um, probably more than, than risk. And the tie to macro is, I think of macro as really just general equilibrium economics and prices, which reflect risk and un risk and time, um, also come out of general equilibrium. So it's all the, it's all the same, <laughs> but a different oh, which, bring, which brings us to your uh, involvement with the uh, Congressional Budget Office. Why don't you tell us how that evolved? Okay, I'm, let's do this short, long story. Um, which is before CBO, um, I jumped at my first real opportunity to work on policy when I went to the Council of Economic Advisors. And I spent a year there as a senior staff economist. And um, I happened to, um, I was working on Hillary Clinton's healthcare task force of all things, um, thinking about long-term care and how to incorporate that in managed competition. In fact, going back to Alan Entoven, he was, um, trying to consult on how to make managed competition a reality within the Clinton scheme. And he would hang out in my office at the old executive building and uh, we would talk about healthcare policy. But anyway, uh, in the course of being at, at um, the council, which I 
truly loved. It was by far the most exciting job I'd had to that point in time. Um, I read the federal budget <laughs> cover to cover, including the appendices, and I basically fell in love with it. I decided that um, the budget was central control of the government, that it was how you could understand what governments do and what they prioritize and how resources, a large fraction of society's resources allocated that way. Um, and so- what year, what year was that? that that was in the early, that was at the end, so. it was the beginning of Bush one and um, I mean, the end of Bush one, the beginning of Clinton. So it was, yeah. Um, 2000. I guess 90, no, no, 92. No, 92. 92. Yeah, so, thank you. Um, okay, so I fell in love with the budget, went back to academia. Um, I happened to be at the Summer Institute eating ice cream in Harvard Square with Steve Zeldis. He mentioned that the director of CBO had asked if he wanted to be chief economist. I said, oh, chief economist at CBO, that would be my dream, you know, budget is everything. So I think he mentioned to them that I was interested. They interviewed me, Dan Crippen, who is the director then hired me. So I went there in 2000 to spend what turned out to be almost two years as the chief economist on um, and that was where I started to understand that probably the place a financial economist can have the most value added in my view in the world is actually inside government because there's such a lack of understanding of even the most basic financial principles and there's so much financial decision-making that's, that's going on. Um, my first big financial project at CBO was actually to take on Fannie and Freddie. Uh, and I've continued to work on it to this day. Back in those days, this was before they were completely bailed out and taken over by the US government. Um, they claimed they received absolutely no subsidy. So uh, <laughs> with, with Marvin Fopp, who you know, Bob, um, <laughs> we wrote a paper estimating the value of the implicit guarantee of Fannie and Freddie. And, um, you know, they, they marched us through <laughs> a hearing with Congress saying how horrible we were and how untrue it was and how they never cost the US taxpayer a penny. So it was quite, a, it was quite interesting. Anyway, um, so at CBO, there was a lot of opportunity to really feel like I had a lot of value added. Um, that first time around as chief economist, I came back after the financial crisis. Um, I actually wrote to Doug Elmendorf, who was then um, the director of CBO, and um, came back as an associate director, um, wanting to be there to kind of deal with everything that had happened during the financial crisis and try to get the budget to, uh, and what they wrote about the budget to reflect more accurately <laughs> the things that were going on. Um, he ultimately endorsed starting a new division at CBO, which is an unusual thing to happen. It was called the Financial Analysis Division. And um, that is the best thing I've ever done in the world, I think. Um, what it did it, is it created a group within the government of basically um, people who are competent to look at what I would call the fair value of government guarantees, credit guarantees, risky investments, and to just try to instill a little bit of market pricing into the narratives that we're pretty much um, ignoring that yeah, prior well, to that time. So uh, that's, uh, you know, that's- I just that's have a couple deal. of comments. One is that um, your comment about the need for financial expertise within government was why Tzvi encouraged me at AU to start the program on financial economics for public policy and for you to be one of my wonderful guest lecturers dealing with uh, the student implicit student debt guarantees. Um, now it something... was a mass. It was a master's degree, right? Yes, yes. Finance, it still is, but it's policy. small. But um, uh, that um, I don't know. Did you? Uh, I guess I don't know whether Senator Warren had been elected yet. <laughs> who? Uh, would have taken a different view on student uh, loan guarantees, but uh, certainly uh, you had it right. And uh, 
we're reaping the uh, the cost of those guarantees at the moment. You might be surprised to know that Senator Warren actually took the other side of the question about whether market prices were relevant um, as head of a congressional inquiry commission to, for TARP. And I wound up working for her, surprisingly, um, along with Will Getzman at Yale on um, directing Duff and Phelps to do evaluation of the assistance that the government had given the big banks, because on that particular issue, um, she was happy to see that doing risk adjustment made the value of that support appear to be more valuable. Um, so, it, you know, it's uh, that was an, that was an interesting experience to see her um, doing something on <clears throat> on the other side of that issue. Would she still stand by that? I mean, does she believe that? You know, these guarantees have a value, even if they don't uh, wind up paying off. Um, I really have no idea what she believes. <laughs> well, yeah, a few years ago, she she thought that uh, that we could charge a zero uh, interest rate because, after all, uh, the government borrowing rate uh, was quite low. So. I'm sure that on, on the issue of student debt, uh, she has not changed. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's get back to you. And so that uh, experience at, uh, at CBO, uh, wow, to create a whole unit that uh, really takes into account the insights from financial economics uh, must be pretty who, who, is in, who is in charge of that unit? now? Um, the person who's currently in charge is named Sebastian Gay. He also is a Chicago PhD. Um, and then in between um, my stint there and Sebastian, um, my former PhD student from Northwestern, Damian Moore, who's one of my favorite economists, um, had been running that group. Uh, I guess, let me just say a few more words about it, because I think it's so important. and. I think one of the things I wanted to explore with you all, which is maybe different than what people always talk about, is the difficulty of getting ideas that aren't already fashionable or very close to it to be perceived as important. Um, so, you know, it's nice that there's now a group that does investment banking, if you will, fair valuation for the US government, but it goes beyond that because, um, as you know, Bob, the the rules for budgeting for credit basically put into law um, doing it a way that financial, that most financial economists would think was wrong. You know, to basically, when we look at the cause, this is the Elizabeth Warren student loans thing. Um, when you look at the cost of something, um, the government by law, when they're talking about credit, doesn't do any risk adjustment. They just look at projected losses and discount at a risk-free rate. And so there's, if you will, an arbitrage opportunity written into the legal system because um, that kind of accounting would effectively say, let you book the equity premium, okay? So if the government wanted to solve its budget um, problems completely, they could just issue government debt at close to 0%, invest in the stock market at say 5%, and book the difference in the profit, it would make the debt look like it went to pay. But that's the accounting that's being done for the many, many trillions of dollars of credit in the US government. So the fact that there's a group within CBO providing other estimates is actually a revolutionary thing to do because the slack that's created by being able to say with a straight face, well, the budget says that student loans make money for the government, where in fact the economic fact is that the government spends a lot of money on students' loans, um, you know, that makes a very large difference to decisions about the allocation of resources. So this is kind of getting back to, you know, I wasn't really exaggerating when I said budgets are central control for the government because they're the, they're the information that policymakers, that Congress and the administration have when they're making trade-offs. And they're not going to question the numbers. Most people take numbers pretty literally. So if something looks like it's making money, well, that's great. Not only can we help students 
but we can make money on top of it. You know, what, what could be better than that? So um, budgeting is a very conservative area. <laughs> and um, for an institution like the Congressional Budget Office to actually acquiesce to creating alternative estimates is like a revolutionary thing to do because the law says to do one thing and then these other estimates are being provided as a point of information. Um, and that happened, interestingly, also because of TARP. <laughs> so to kind of circle back, if TARP hadn't been- Let's, started, let's stop for our listeners. Oh, let's TARP, I'm sorry, the Troubled does. Asset Release Program. I'm so sorry, I know I talk as if people might know all this stuff. But we had a financial crisis, we bailed out all the banks, TARP was the legislation that authorized all that money to go to the banks. Um, and so from a budget perspective, you know, there's a question of, well, how much do you think that all cost? And if you, um, and the thing that I've been trying to get governments to do, which is to account for things at fair value, which basically means an approximation of what the market would charge for something, um, fair value rather than market value often, because as soon as the government does something, it crowds out the private sector, so you don't have a directly comparable price, so you need to some kind of model. Anyway, <laughs> um, the yeah. fact is the TARP would have looked potentially like it made money for the government had they not done this risk adjustment, had they not gone to this kind of fair value basis. And so the budget committees, this is all very inside baseball in Washington. But let me just say that it was, it was kind of a coup to have a situation where we got, where CBO got agreement to be able to provide fair value estimates in certain situations. And um, it's very fragile, actually. It could go away at any time. And I'm very proud to say that I've worked, I think, with six different CBO directors from the time I started in 2000. Um, to the present where I'm still connected to them. And they've all been supportive of continuing to provide this information. And, you know, it, it's, it's become quite partisan actually, which is one of the saddest things for me in my life, which is um, the Republicans like it, not necessarily because it's intellectually the right thing to do, but because by making programs appear more expensive it's easier to fight against them. And Democrats don't like it because it makes programs they like appear more expensive. Um, so, you know, it, as a political punching bag, it's kind of uncomfortable. But in any case, it's still there and it's a big deal. And um, just, to, <laughs> I'm not gonna leave the topic because it's what's most important to me. So I've, I've actually, I'm still working with them. I'm working now with some international organizations with the IMF and the OECD on some other areas where the same kind of tension exists and it makes a huge difference whether or not you use financial economics properly. Yeah, so what do other countries do in their budgeting? <laughs> They're worse than the United States. So a really <laughs> interesting situation is, um, so for instance, with, um, with COVID, governments around the world created credit support programs just like the US did and um, for in most countries, a credit guarantee would be described as below the line, which basically means that it wouldn't appear as a budgetary cost until there was a default loss. realization and so a cash loss. Um, so that can make guarantees seem like a very, very cheap thing to do, which kind of explains why massive amounts of guarantee authority were created everywhere. Hmm. And of uh, course, government guarantees is a way of giving hidden subsidies. That's basically. right. Um, all credit when you don't do risk adjustment is a way of doing hidden subsidies. So the, this, this whole push to get governments to recognize a fuller cost of credit is because credit makes it easy to hide subsidies. Credit and con any kind of contingent claim, any kind of guarantee lacks transparency, it lacks a rigorous basis for budgeting, and then to get back to issues that might be closer to your heart, it can create considerable risk for the future. Because the reason we discount those cash flows at a higher rate or say is because, you know, there it's more likely that there will be defaults in future bad states of the world. And so in terms of future fiscal risk, 
um, you create a lot of guarantees today and you just hope that you don't have another downturn in the near future because that's the point where you'll see a lot of defaults, you'll see a lot of calls on those guarantees and you won't have the fiscal resources um, to deal with those defaults and everything else the government wants to do to fight the current crisis. So all of this is to say that risk adjustment isn't, it isn't a fantasy and the biggest challenge to me is really communications. How do you make it feel real? Because most economists actually, not just government officials, think of value as cash. And that's true when you're talking about bread and butter, but it's not true when you're thinking about long lived risky claims. Yeah, and, and it's very difficult to persuade people who are in trade in finance and in, in valuing it's really option valuation. It's very difficult to persuade them that if the guarantee hasn't paid off, it still had a cost. Right. Okay, there's, they say it, it didn't cost anything. Does the, pri does the private sector uh, do a, job, a reasonable job? Of well, it's it's adjusting. more visible in a private sector. I mean, you buy, people complain all the time if they buy insurance and then they don't collect on it, which is kind of <laughs> stupid because you don't want to collect on it. But you don't want your something. house to burn down. Exactly. So it's, it's one of the tougher things for a financial economist to get across. So that, that leads me to the question that uh, you know, I noted about um, whether there's a gap between you know, reasonably well-trained economists <clears throat> and, um, and finance and financial economists on particular issues and how it may come to uh, change people's views on various issues or estimates. What, what's your thinking on that? And has it changed over your career? Um, so I think I would say my thinking has come more and more to agree with Zui and with Bob Merton, um, who I think are in agreement that there is a fundamental difference in the way most economists think and the way financial economists think, um, and that it makes a huge difference in how one assesses the consequences of different actions. So the example that's most on my mind these days, probably not surprisingly, is so-called modern monetary theory which um, is um, the fanciful view that if um, the growth rate G is greater than the interest rate R, then it's okay for governments <laughs> to accumulate massive debt because you'll pretty much grow out of it and you can just sustain the interest payments. Bless you. So, um, you know, that whole line of reasoning is just nonsensical when you come at it from a financial economics point of view. Um, clearly the potential for stress caused by large debts and deficits has to do with the uncertainty about future growth rates, the uncertainty about future rates of return and so to even discuss the idea of what fiscal sustainability means without recognition of the risk and really the state prices, uh, you know, the, the cost of that risk, how it's different in different states of the world, you know, it's just, an, it's just a non-starter. And so I think it, that's just a good example of where um, a lot of economists are willing to think that an approximation based on certainty equivalence is going to give you a good enough picture. Whereas 
understanding risk and its costs and realizations is just first order to the issue. It's, well, you it's know, kind of, it's kind of interesting that, you know, Debbie is at MIT now and she's director of, it, it should be said, she's director of a program uh, designed to focus research and teaching on uh, public policy issues in, in finance. And uh, in fact, the visitor, the uh, visitor in chief this year is Ben Bernanke. Uh, so it gives you a sense of, you know, this I'm is policy it. oriented, yes. Uh, and the guy who was there last year, or did, one of them was appointed the head of the SEC. Uh, chief economist. Chief no, no, He no. was their chief economist. But oh, oh, but he wasn't with us. Gary Gensler was not. Oh, I thought he was with your group. That's fine. He was at MIT. That's right. He was at Sloan. So we were happy to have him at Sloan. Right. But there is very little interaction with the economics department. Still. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I was, um, you know, in, in terms of my own modest learning about all this stuff, uh, I was struck by how a uh, wide range of topics, whether it's labor economics or the environment or um, even cost benefit analysis in, in public finance, how, what a wide range of topics that the insights from financial economics could bring, um, but often is not brought. Correct. <laughs> and, um, it's, it's, it's sort of strange to me because usually those ga intellectual gaps are um, very attractive for young academics to try to fill. And so I don't really fully understand. I mean, there is some movement on some of these things, but um, if for example, something is uh, clearly uh, involving uh, uh, risk in a sensible way, like cost benefit analysis. If the textbooks on cost benefit analysis still do not use optionality and other tools from finance, it, it's it's sort of quite striking. Yeah, you well, have an you explanation. Wanna, you, the three of us are going to write a textbook. I've been telling Zvitas for years right. that um, probably the biggest value added thing I can do when I run out of energy for some of these other things is to um, write a textbook for finance for public policy schools, because I think people don't really even know how to go about starting to teach it. And yeah. it, it, would be a, it would be a pretty big contribution to help people. Well, you did. At, when you were at Northwestern, I, I seem to recall you organized a conference on guarantee, government guarantees, right? Yeah. And that a book came out of that? Yes. But it, not yes. a textbook. Not a textbook, just a collection of papers. I mean, I think the, the challenge is to, the challenge of everything is communication, right? And there's so much information in the world and it's so hard to catch people's attention and you have to really think about whose attention it is you want to catch. Um, but I think that to get people in policy schools to be comfortable teaching something that's more financially based, they themselves don't feel like they're on top of finance. And so you Definitely. need to give them um, tools to make it relatively easy to do that. So I think it's really like everything, 90% of the work is probably 95% of the work is in exposition and re-exposition and practicing and seeing what works for people. Now, well, one you... other area of public policy, if I might, uh, I, I keep uh, shouting down, Bob. Go ahead. I want to let you say something. No, no, I, go... wanted, I wanted to just point out that another thing that Debbie does in the arena of public policy is serve on something called the Shadow Open Market Committee. Mm. Would you describe what that is, Debbie? 
because I'm not sure myself. I know. So that's um, an old and venerable organization of economists that was started in the early 1970s um, with, by Carl Bruner and other aficionados of, um, who are monetarists. And um, over the years has members that are a combination of academics who view themselves broadly as monetarists and um, some industrial economists, former Federal Reserve or other central bank officials. Um, so how did I get involved in this group? Well, I'm very bad at saying no, as, uh, as you are the beneficiaries of, but um, the, so it's, a, so what the group does is they look at the Fed's policies, they write position papers, they meet several times a year, kind of have a public meeting um, often have a guest speaker who's a high official at a central bank. Um, but it was a, and <laughs> I, I, I am sure that the reason they invited me because Anna Schwartz, who unfortunately had died quite a few years ago, was still the only female on their webpage. So I think they needed a replacement for that. Um, but, but seriously, it was an opportunity um, to return to some of the issues I think are very important. And I'll say the issue that has really sucked me in being back to that is returning more to my interest in monetary policy, but now with this fiscal policy overlay. So I think the whole set of issues about the line between monetary and fiscal policy has become more and more blurred to the point where I no longer even believe that monetary policy that has any real effects isn't essentially a fiscal policy. Um, but in any case, it's it's an opportunity to try to be more of a public intellectual. I think uh, often in academics, we just write to each other and it's really valuable to have a forum where I'm asked to write an essay on some idea that makes sense, but doesn't have the dotting I's and crossing T's of refereed academic publications and tries to speak to a different kind of audience. So that's, that's what's in it for me. Um, and I, I should say I'm not particularly a monetarist, but I am, um, I am very interested in the whole concept of central banks as independent institutions and what that really means in a democracy and where the boundaries should be on um, what they do and what should be controlled by the legislature where it's okay to give them latitude. So it, it's been, it's been totally fascinating to um, turn back to some of those questions. Yes, and, and you are uh, on record as being an advocate of uh, viewing the government as a financial institution. Absolutely. So that's right. I think of governments as the world's largest financial institutions, even in seemingly capitalist countries like the United States. Um, I mean, it, just to stay on the monetary policy front, so uh, really a sea change in monetary policy that hasn't gotten as much attention as it might is the change um, I guess I'll, about, almost a decade now ago, but it's been very important is that the Fed now pays interest on reserves. Mm. And um, it, it chooses the rate that it pays of interest and it does it on many trillions of dollars of reserves. The Fed has a very large balance sheet. So now in the United States, an administratively set interest rate is in some sense the base rate for the economy. Mm. That's quite different than the regime where the Fed was basically pushing around an overnight Fed funds rate by plus or minus 25 basis points. I mean, this is um, a much, this is just a much, I think, more important tool. And it's, fundamentally fiscal because to the extent that the Fed wants to 
needs more reserves to fund a larger balance sheet, and they pay over what you might think of a market interest rate to do that from a consolidated balance sheet point of view, or you think of the central bank as just another arm of the government, that is a fiscal action, which is transferring public resources to the financial system, to the, to the private sector. And so, you know, just, just as an example of how all these things come back to finance, they come back to um, the government as a fiscal actor and as a financial actor. Well, I recall the paper by uh, Zvi Bodhi, Robert Merton, and Dale Gray, where um, the government is one part of the sector, the banking sector, the corporate sector, household sector, and all with risks and um, Yeah, um, well, the main thing was taking account of risks. guarantees, right? Asymmetrical was, risks. That's a hard thing for people to understand, isn't it? Tzvi and Debbie, uh, the idea of, um, you know, if it comes up heads, it's one thing. Oh yeah, heads, no, they, the, the way we put it in that paper, and I think Debbie agrees with this, is it's a mistake to look at debt as just debt. It's, it, unless it's completely risk-free, any bond is a contingent claim. It's, it's uh, the promise, uh, which is like a bond, minus a put option. And if you get that, then you're on the right track. And if you don't see that, uh, it's kind of hopeless. Because you don't get a correct understanding of what capital is, right? Because the capitalist element of contingent claim to it. Would you agree, Deb? Absolutely. And I think that is a, that was a great paper. The, but it had almost yeah. no effect on macroeconomists that I could tell. You know, it's interesting because you both are focusing on talking to our fellow economists who are macroeconomists or in some other line of economics. And I've personally chosen to focus on economists in the public sector mm. um, because I don't want to sound too cynical, but you know, academics pursue what they're interested in and the various fields have kind of a life of their own, which is not necessarily connected to seeking any particularly important truth, but to kind of going down a particular path and exploring a set of ideas. And particularly for young people in academics, there's no return on trying to buck that trend because you can't publish if you do. So, um, I. You know, I am very results oriented. Like I actually, <laughs> I'm glad that I have a good job at a great university and have been able to publish papers that some people have read, but I will really only consider what I've done to be a true success if it changes the rules by which some government somewhere reports on these things. And um, I see the way of doing that as communicating with the economists at OMB and CBO and Treasury and the IMF and the OECD. You know, I'm not sure that it's either possible or very productive to change the hearts and minds of um, academics. academics. Yeah, it's true. It's, de it's definitely, definitely true. And it's, by the way, it's not just in economics. Uh, it's in psychology as well. Clinical psychology is ignored at the best universities in the psych departments. Not interested in clinical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, we've, we've taken a, almost an hour, but we still have a little time. Um, Sveed, would you like to wrap up with a few additional questions? Uh, well, uh, yeah, uh, the, the question would be, what are your plans for the future? 
And maybe I know, and off, by the way, we didn't mention that she's an environmentalist. But maybe you could bring in um, the, the role of your center too and describe a little more about that. Sounds good. So my plans for the future are to, uh, professionally, my plans for the future are, as I kind of alluded to, to continue to look for a way to capture some attention, some popular attention, um, maybe among academics, hopefully among people who are interested in accountability in a public setting in measuring things differently and to continue to speak about it and teach about it and work on as many projects as I can to try to make it feel real to people. Keep on pounding away at how can you do this more simply? What is really essential? What's unnecessary? How can you do it? So um, that continues to be an obsession, but when I get tired, <laughs> <laughs> of that, um, I don't know what I'll do <laughs> because it is it is rather tiring to um, continue down what has now a pretty familiar path. I would like to um, I would actually like to work on a textbook with one or both of you, which um, made the, it possible to improve financial education in public policy schools. Um, I'll skip my future plans because I really have, I, I live from moment to moment. I'm kind of an in real time sort of person with almost no, no future, not very future looking. Um, I, do, I do feel like um, it's true as we noted. Um, it's, it's interesting to me to always think about, to actually know what people's motivations are. And I suppose, you know, as we had, I, you, you had both, I guess, talked indirectly about people who have influenced me, but probably the biggest influence intellectually on me in the world has been Peter Singer, who's a philosopher who writes about, um, well, utility theory, but animal rights at Princeton. He's quite a controversial guy, um, but, but I am, quite concerned with issues of ethics and the environment and how we treat other species. And in an odd way, I do feel that um, how we value resources, natural resources, um, has a big effect on the way we treat them. I mean, as, as many all economists know, if you put a zero price on something, you treat it as free and you overuse it. And so I do see a lot of this as is very indirectly and probably too clever by half directed to that kind of overarching sense that we are very wasteful as a species because we don't put enough value on things that are hard to see. And tell us a little bit about your center. And my center, good. The Olive Center for Finance and Policy um, was actually the brainchild of Bob Merton who comes up often in this conversation and Andrew Lowe. And when I came to MIT, that was actually after I came back from the Congressional Budget Office the second time, um, the plan was to start a center like this. Um, there are many centers around the country that touch on finance and policy. Um, like those other centers, um, we're interested in supporting research and educational initiatives that improve policy, but probably what makes the perspective um, of the Golub Center fairly unique is this emphasis on, as we said, um, governments as being financial institutions and financial actors in themselves, not just regulators of the financial system. So I think in the United States, we tend to have this kind of fantasy that the private sector does stuff and then the government, to the extent that it touches the private sector on the financial sphere, does it through its regulatory actions. Whereas, you know, governments decide what infrastructure to buy. They decide on a lot of credit, mortgages, student loans, et cetera. They, um, so this idea of government as the largest financial institution, as a decision maker, and what can you do to support the government in making uh, more informed decisions when it acts as a financial player is very important. And I think um, that also has a lot of international importance because if you think of the 
countries that have become so much more important in the last few decades, China, state-owned enterprises. Um, you know, you have, if you, if you look anywhere in the world, there's such a large footprint of government decision-making and relatively little support given to it in research. So the hope is that the center will um, provide resources and incentives for people to do research they might not have otherwise done. I always think about the value of a center is to try to be inframarginal. Um, it's hard to be right. inframarginal in life um, or in a center. And, uh, but anyway, that's, that's, the, that's the goal um, of the center. And it's been a pleasure to have the opportunity to try to make some progress with that. Well, it's been a real pleasure uh, to talk with you, Debbie, and uh, maybe we'll take you up on the, the textbook idea. Um, I was uh, on the board of the APEM, the Association for Public Policy and Management. I'm sure there'd be some people there that would be interested. Um, well, Society Debbie for has presented there at their conference. Oh, yeah. Society for Government Economists is another organization that uh, that uh, we could uh, publicize our textbook once it's written. <laughs> but uh, uh, Tzvi, you have any uh, parting thoughts? Um, not really, no. <laughs> well, thanks again. Debbie, for taking the time. Um, this is uh, a very substantive uh, discussion of a range of issues, and uh, we hope listeners will be able to uh, take advantage of your knowledge. Uh, We're going to have to have closed captions. We'll be <laughs> we'll be we'll be posting. closed captions explaining, you know, some of the things and references. So we'll be posting uh, this interview uh, in a week or so, and uh, maybe less. And uh, we'll make sure that it uh, gets broad circulation. So thanks again. Thank you. Take care. Take Bye. care. Bye. Bye.